Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, um, Art F City and, Queen, and the Queens Museum for organizing and hosting us. This is the panel on ownership. My name is Deborah Brown. I'm an artist who has a studio in Bushwick where I run a gallery called Storefront 10 Eck in a building on 10 Eck Street, um, which I own. Uh, I, along with my distinguished panelists, Esther Robinson, Gabriel Florenz, Risa Shoup, and Stephen Englander are going to be talking about how artists can enter this internecine, very um, opaque and unfriendly real estate market uh, as owners. Uh, each of us has a different experience, and I think it would be really great if we each introduce ourselves and speak briefly initially about why we really are on this panel. What do we have to offer you? What ideas and strategies do we have so that this ownership discussion doesn't just um, become a series of rants and hand-wringings, about the fact that a lot of artists are being displaced from communities um, in which they help create a lot of value and vibrancy. Uh, our format will be 45 minutes of discussion among ourselves, followed by 15 minutes of questions. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Esther, and please go down the line. Uh, if you would speak maybe for like five, ten minutes about your own specific take on the topic, which we've been invited to present ideas about, and then maybe we'll send it back to me and we'll begin to engage with each other. So thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this gray day. Um, so I'm going to say three things. One, I am an artist in New York City. I uh, founded an organization called Art Home. We have a table in the back. That organization was uh, founded to create an alternate support system for artists based on asset building. The idea being that most of the support for artists is currently being given to your work, making your work. And I believe strongly that what we need to do is feed the self-sufficiency of individuals. And that training can include anything from financial literacy to direct training on, on ownership possibilities, small business startup. As such, um, Art Home has a home ownership program that we started with the New York Mortgage Coalition. There's information in the back, but I'll talk about it more on the panel. We also have a match grant savings program for arts-based businesses in New York and five other states. Um, and we do a lot of interventions like that that are basically looking at artists and trying to meet you where you are and train you up into the opportunities you'd like to have. I'm also here um, because we currently, as an initiative that we feel is essential for New York City, but also for other kinds of cities, um, are pioneering a mobile studio project, a workspace project, um, called Art built mobile studios. They're eight and a half feet wide by 20 feet long, the current prototype. They can be shorter. Um, and there's one currently 50 feet to the left of the museum. So if you go out the doors and go left, you can see it. Um, but they're very cheap to build, pretty straightforward to move, and to me represent a pretty interesting opportunity for artists to build their own and own their own workspaces. Uh, we have some regulatory hurdles to clear in New York City. Um, but we're currently beta testing them here and in Philadelphia and probably two other cities over the next year. Uh, hello, my name is Gabriel uh, Florenz. I um, help start and I'm currently the director of a uh, space called Pioneer Works, which is a multidisciplinary nonprofit space. Um, we, um, we basically promote arts and sciences through a bunch of diverse means. Uh, we have an international residency program where we provide free space for artists, scientists, and creatives. We have a museum and um, we, where we have an exhibition program and a performance program. We have a publishing house. We have a music studio and a radio station, as well as an educational program. Um, we have a huge garden with, uh, with a container structure where there's a music studio. Um, and the space is interesting because it was only possible because it was started by uh, the artist Dustin Yellen. And it was started because he was able to buy it. Um, we are babies and we've only had the nonprofit for two years. And we, we bought it four years ago and we renovated it from a complete uh, disaster. I mean, it was, there was no windows. There was white paint over every inch of brick and wood. And it was a very um, intense renovation project that he fueled through his art and through begging collectors for loans and going around everywhere, kind of, you know, making it happen with the belief that he was doing it not as his private studio, but as a space where other people could come together 
and be supported with projects. And those projects are not only providing private space for artists to work in, but they're, there's a public interaction constantly. So I like the idea that there's always the opportunity for, for kind of public activity next to artists working so that these things are um, always interlaced and that that diversity is constantly creating. A lot of what allows artists to take advantage of these opportunities, the internet makes everything very transparent. You can find out what the market is for properties in a neighborhood. You can see what things are being mortgaged for, if there's much trading going on, speculating, uh, what things are valued at. I think artists passively move into a place and just associate with one another. They don't think about the way that they should be trying to ensure their future. And in a way, that is really no different than anybody else who comes to New York City. You're in a place that's very competitive now, and it's those properties like ABC No Rio just don't exist anymore in Manhattan, certainly, but they're in other places. And there are opportunities for artists still, but you have to know how to take advantage of them. And I think with some education, you can do it too. And if you want to stay in New York, that's one of the things you should consider. Collective action is great. I'm really in awe of the people who've been able to work together. Um, my shtick has been to try and create opportunities within the properties that I own for other people, uh, like the gallery that I run where I show other people's work is in a building that I own. So I really am coming at it from a slightly different point of view. Um, I would urge some caution about the fact that the real estate market is so hot right now in all these quarters that you're competing against people who can move really quickly. Collective action takes a lot of organizing, which takes time, and it doesn't privilege this kind of activity as much as you might hope it does. And so, I mean, I know that from experience. So um, I'm happy to give advice on, that, on this subject and to try and facilitate a conversation that incorporates many of the interesting points of view that we've seen here today. Uh, so I would ask, um, Esther, how are you going about disseminating this information about how artists can empower themselves to become uh, owners? How do, how do you actually conduct, how do you disseminate and sure. involve? I, mean, I actually want to pull one step back. And I want everyone in this room to take a second and think about a skill that you, which you acquired recently. Like, like every time I deal with, I, I, I'll do like an eight-hour personal finance boot camp for part of our IDA process, right? And like, if I say to somebody, "What are you working on?" and they'll be like, oh, "I'm working on this thing," and it's like six thousand Barbie heads, and I'm going to make a tower, and it's going to be in this place that's totally inaccessible, my mountain. And I'll be like, "Can you get a savings account?" And they'll be like, "No," right? There's gonna, there's like a hurdle. There's something about thinking about that kind of baseline self-sufficiency that I think is really crucial to, to demystify and unpack. And the reason I say this is because this is a nasty market. This isn't, developer-led displacement is the strongest phenomenon in our city currently. Developers are seizing opportunities. They can warehouse as a tax offset a lot because they make money by losing money. We, we can't necessarily compete with that. We can't. What we can do, though, as individuals, as incredibly unparalleled problem solvers, which is what I truly believe the tribe of artists is, I believe if we can empower ourselves, we, I, you can't bet against us. We will find weird ways through stuff, weird ways to things. But we can't, don't self-handicap. So a couple of things. On an individual level, if you're not going, and, and actually on an individual level that gets aggregated if you're doing something collective, you have to be cognizant of how money works, right? On a most basic level, if you want to get a commercial bank loan, right? Or even as a person, like a, a bank loan in general, right? You need to have a good credit score and you need to have a down payment. And that doesn't matter who you are. If that, if you're going to go the commercial bank route, that is the bottom tier of what you got to do. So if any of you want to own anything, the first thing you have to do is know what your credit score is. You have to improve your credit score and get it fucking sweet. Sorry for my swearing. I'm so tired. Um, if you get it sweet, you have a sweet credit score, and then you need to start saving money. Now, I don't know how you're going to save money, right? I know that all of our incomes are so tight. This, it's so insane right now. But I can tell you that you're resourceful. So maybe you have a, a, a painting or a, or a video or something you sell every once in a while. And then you just take that money and you park it. You get your tax return and you park it. You need to get it out of your income stream. 
You need to literally, you can live on almost nothing. We've proved it, right? You've proved it last week. Okay, so do that. And when you get extra money, just park it away. And that is your out of here money. That is my stabilization money. And you do not touch it. And then you turn around. And the reason I'm telling you this is, yes, it's nearly impossible to do this. But I teach these homeownership classes all the time. And the number one call I get about homeownership is, my landlord loves me. They have no relatives. They want me to buy this building. And I'm in no position to do it. What do I do? And I can't help you in the three months it takes to fight to do that, right? You need to have self-actualized to the point where your credit score is good and you have some kind of down payment because in that situation, that opportunity could be yours. It really could. And I see it over and over again. The other thing, again, as an individual, is the affordable housing lottery system in New York City. Now, again, it's a lottery. Do you always win the lottery? No. I have, I would say on average, three to four artists every year win that damn lottery. Because they persevere. Is it a pain in the butt? Yes. You have to go to the little place. And I have a resource page on my table back there. I'll show you where you can go to find. And you can just say, like, sign up for the. Now, the affordable. Into one of the. Almost exact one to one. The same damn as owning. They're both for broke people. Who could rent. Maybe you should yourself that little. Two of my people back. There's, but there's. We have the handbook of things so you can counseling. The part. It's not just for. And but they're item for every. Also, by years of income point. You show them your money that counts. That's it. Sure to own all your tax your tax right like come you show a certain amount of mortgage qualification our code you can just the digital download PDF onto your phone uh, I mean I think that's so amazing the, the main thing economically because like a completely stratification because the, or even it's like it's like knocking out nine of the artists that I personally know in New York so I think you know where are these neighbors where where are these neighbors in New York artists are supposed to like actually afford and it's how hard it is to like and, and I think that it is that started as a conversation amongst a bunch of us and resulted in about a month in 300 people paying $10 to become members of this investment co-op and now we have $3,000 in the bank and a lot of leverage uh, and we get to talk to the city about what we might do might help us and we get to talk to private and what they might want to do together and we get to talk and so that happened and that's three and I want to fab to purchase of eight properties uh, with ultimately 12 different owners and that took about four years well four years eight properties one property every six months that's a hell of a lot faster than it takes some individuals to buy a house so collective action is complicated and collective action requires additional literacy and patience for communication doesn't necessarily require more time I just want to say that so it doesn't put you off um, let's see, I'd like to, I uh, guess, reiterate um, one thing Esther said about looking for housing
So again, I think a, 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 a small group of people, my small group of people is 50. A group of people with, you know, commitment and drive and who actually want to see something done can actually keep pushing forward and meet the challenges that are faced. It's, uh, you know, it's more than just will, but it's, uh, in a lot of respects, it's just that stick to itiveness and you can do it. And just to double underline that, I think, you know, when you're dealing, when you're working in a constant state of precariousness as artists are, and you are de dealing with marginalization on any number of levels, it's helpful to be in a group, right? Because then you have more people to handle more topics at a given time. So maybe it does take seven years or 20 years, but you're working also on a larger project and that's appropriate to take a long time, but you're also working together. And I think that feeds into a lot of what, you know, Esther's been doing around the mobile studio project too. Like you need more people to do larger things. I also want to say that like, I, I, I believe in ownership, but I also believe in asset building. And sometimes ownership is not at all appropriate. Sometimes we're too broke to own, and that's okay. Then you need to find a stable rental situation or as stable as you can get, and then you need to save. Saving becomes the through line for all of this. And part of the rationale for the, built, the, the Art Built Mobile Studio was that I feel like there's a whole ton of people, and I don't mean just artists, I mean small-scale social service providers, micro-entrepreneurs, people for whom ownership might only be the place where they worked, and if we could give them the opportunity to decouple that from the built environment, to say, you don't have to own that storefront. You could own this. This could move where you need it to be to meet the people you want it to meet, right? And you could own it and move it. Then suddenly the little guy has a way to interact with the city. I trust my people to know where to go and what to do. I do, actually. I know that they'll problem solve their way out of that problem. What I can't do is say, I'm going to stand by and wait for them to get priced completely out of everything and any chance of interacting with our city. That, that we can't let pass. I think um, just to Stephen's point about uh, the conundrum of, of trying to fund a project that, that doesn't exist or it exists like as a vision, it's, it, it's, it's, it seems impossible. I mean, like I remember trying to show people, even our building that we, we owned and we were starting a nonprofit, but it was like a dungeon and it was destroyed and people were like, are you guys crazy? I mean, it's like, there's no possible way that the, you could, they can't see the vision. And it's, 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 it's really hard to get through that without, you know, people supporting that vision. And it's like now we have a beautiful space and a garden and studios and tons of programming and, you know, 3,000 students have come through in the last year and a half. And it's like now we, funding is becoming so much easier and it was so hard to get over that hurdle. But, you know, how do you, people kind of trust these organizations and support their vision before they've had the opportunity to really like, you know, create something that you can see. I think well, it's I, actually, I'd like to jump in here and just say that Dustin is a model for a kind of um, philanthropy that could exist on a bigger scale. There are many successful artists in New York and they have incredible real estate. I've seen some of it. Their studios are huge. They have big staffs that work in these big buildings. And they've been able to compete in the real estate market and buy these buildings. And these folks uh, need to give back, I think. And Dustin's a good example of somebody who has done that. He's pyramided his own resources to create an incredibly gorgeous architectural space for his own work and that other people can use. It would be really interesting to see uh, more people like that, and there are many artists in New York City at the top of the food chain who could uh, be a little bit more sympathetic to their peers because those are the people who are reaping um, a lot of the benefits of the real estate and the art market. And so I think um, I'm still uh, leaning on the private side, which is, is leverage those assets that are in our community, and those artists were not known at one point, so they know what it's like to be starting out in New York. I think, I don't know how to put pressure on them, mm -hmm. but I think it's an unused, it's a model that needs to be explored more and replicated, which is what Dustin has done. I will just add, sorry, that um, uh, Pioneer Works is, a, is an individual, it's a nonprofit organization that, that Dustin, um, we have a lease with Dustin. He doesn't make any of his work in the space. So he's actually ended up donating the entire space to the nonprofit, and he donates the rent to the nonprofit, which is why we can do it, which is incredibly charitable. His studio is two doors down that, that we built. So it's um, just to make that clear. I think part of what we're talking about right now is that there are, there are multiple models to be engaged with 
uh, in order to purchase property. And there's a model, uh, a charity model in which, you know, someone of incredible means is able to donate that property. And there are, and there are Pioneer Works is a great example of this. Um, while the Invisible Dog pays rent, I would put it somewhere closer to that on the spectrum. Shashama is another thing that works more like this, where you're leveraging private connections and private investment for charity in order to subsidize workspace for artists. Um, I think, and I want, I want to point out something that's very dangerous if we don't add other things on this spectrum of models for ownership, which is letting the state off the hook, right? And we, we see this all the time in the argument for um, increasing um, rent regulation and, and issues with affordable housing. We can't just wait for private developers to come in and save us because uh, it's not in their best interest to do so and they probably won't do it and they're not as sympathetic as individuals like we're talking about in the arts. Um, so I think we also have to put some pressure on the state and organize and think again collectively I strange that I've become this person I used to be like a hired gun but I do believe in this. So yeah we have to work collectively to put pressure and, and really bring the heat so that we can um, get what we want from New York City and also change the way that development works here. That's part of the problem. It, it does, development does happen too fast and too expensively for many of us to compete, but that doesn't mean that we don't try to change that. But there are models for that. The, the, uh, the Soho Noho Artist District, which was a loft law that was started in the 70s, uh, was administered by a panel who decided who could be an artist and live in that area, and it was intended to protect artists from being displaced. I sat on that panel for 20 years. I was one of two panelists who got to decide now that I'm not on it anymore, I can say and out myself, who got to live in, in Soho and NoHo. And believe me, the people who are applying for that now are people like Bruce Nauman, Bon Jovi, and then a lot of people who try and fake their way into it. And it, it has almost no purpose, and yet it's a law. It has to continue to be administered. That panel continues to meet and decide who gets to be an artist in New York City. But it really has just hamstrung artists from selling their property uh, because there aren't enough really rich artists to qualify to actually live in those buildings. So it's a lot of uh, people who are faking their way into it. It's a real sham. And the government will never enact a law like that again. Yeah. You can see it because they don't want to be saddled with it now, but they can't repeal it. Right. There's not enough of a constituency. So, so, so I could, offer that as a model yeah. for how government intervention is not going to save this issue. Well, but here's the thing, guys. No one's coming to save you. I'm sorry. There's no, there's no white knight that's going to come in on a horse. And give you, I mean, listen, if they come with that bag of gold, actually just tell them to come hang out with me because I'm down with that. But they're not coming. So what are you doing for you? That's it. That's it. And... If you by yourself think, I can't do it, then you got to look around and say, who else is doing it? You think I'm doing mobile studios by myself? No, I'm also part of the real estate collective. Why? Because it's all hands on deck. That's it. And you can't be alone. You want to work in your garret by yourself? Guess what? You're going to go down. That ship is sinking with you by yourself. Okay, how's that going to go? That's going to be terrible. And you're going to be lonely and cold and broke and maybe in your parents' basement, which is my worst nightmare. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. What you've heard from all of these people is they had an idea that seemed impossible. It was impossible, and they did it. And here's the thing. You're all artists. What the hell do you get up and do every day? You look at something blank. You look at a space in the world in which there is nothing, and you turn that into something, something of value, something of meaning, something of beauty. And that, my friend, is impossible. And that is the first step. That is the skill that's going to get you this thing. And I can't tell you how you're going to do it because I don't even understand your art. But I can tell you, I believe in your intelligence. I believe in your fortitude. And I believe that you love this city as much as I do. And that you're going to join all of this and go for it. Because that's it. We, yeah, that's it. We have no more time. It ran out. And the guy on that horse with that bag of cash, he went to Los Angeles. And he can go there because he can fund that chick's plastic surgery that you don't want to know anyway. Okay. Why did I have the energy drink? I'm like, now I'm like, why? But do you think, like, to, to your point... 
of of not letting the kind of uh, public sector off the off the hook per se. I mean, and I and I do think that even though it's it's so hard to to get in there, and I think we're better off just fighting and working as hard as you can and making it happen and making yeah. something out of nothing. And that's how most things do happen. But I don't think that developers should be given these oh, no. insane, yeah. you know, Fight properties for 21A for 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 nothing because yeah. they like in Red Hook, you know, there was. Some people, they got a huge building because they got a tenant fairway. They gave all these artists spaces, and then now they're all getting kicked out. And it's like, why are these, these artists are used as assets, and these artists should be given the, at least the opportunity and help to buy these places yeah. and to stay there. And that's, I think, something we can't ignore. Absolutely, that's, yeah. Absolutely, and these, these artists, you artists, us artists, we're all part of an even larger constituency of people living in precariousness who have like the same concerns, which is affordable real estate, to have jobs that pay for our lives so that we can live somewhere that we can also afford. And so it is in our best interests to uh, ally ourselves with a larger campaigns around affordable uh, affordability and anti-displacement work. Or at least that's what I think. Hi, I have a question for Risa. You had mentioned something about New York City properties that are um, dispositioned. What does that mean, disposition? So very quickly, um, disposition has a lot of definitions, but the way that I'm using it is the process through which the city uh, relinquishes ownership to a private institution or an individual. Um, and that is usually done, but not always below market rate. And you can, I will, um, because I was not a founder at FAB and I am not a lawyer, I, um, I would rather encourage you to sort of look into that on your own. And there's like a ton of stories about disposition and how it works beyond the arts. And it's, it's inspiring. It also requires a ton of political organizing. And again, that was talked about a lot in the last panel. And I just want to underscore everything that was said there. Um, but I hope that's helpful a little bit. If I could chime in on that as well, since um, Norio also got his property through a similar process as the fourth arts block. So early on, I said I was sort of a dinosaur. So the, this process of disposing of these real estate assets by the city of New York actually began under the Giuliani administration, including the disposition of the, uh, the properties that the squatters ended up taking. So it was part of privatizing the vast real estate holdings that the city had acquired through the in-rem process in the late 60s and 70s when they foreclosed on many several tens of thousands of properties in all five boroughs. By the time of the Giuliani administration, they sort of did a, wanted to actually empty out that portfolio of buildings. Some of them were sold to private developers. Some of them were disposed of to community development corporations. Some of them were provided to arts organizations like the theaters on 4th Street and to ABC No Rio. Um, but the, the, the city had long had a history of doing that from, from the late 60s through the 70s. It was accelerated in the, Juli, the tail end of the Giuliani administration. Uh, a little bit of historical. They wouldn't sell the property for a dollar. A lot of times it would go at auction. It was still a good deal, you know. But um, it, it, the, the way below market rate were to nonprofit organizations, um, community development groups, uh, other nonprofits. For what they said was a community, it had to be a demonstrable community uh, purpose. But also on that, I think it's important to recognize that part of our job as citizens is to watchdog what community benefit means and to watchdog that with our community members, right, that aren't artists, that the community benefits a real thing and that all of these tax breaks are meant to engender community benefit and that we have to collectively, as a city, make sure that that benefit is collected upon because we're actually losing out in tax revenue right. for this. And again, as part of our lives as citizens and citizen artists, that needs to be part of the way that we protect our lives and our livelihood here is 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 actually watchdogging that. Yeah. 
Because the city also buys property with your tax dollars, and you can watch those sales happen and find out how much they are. And then you can learn if there's a plan for the development of that property. And then you can think what it means to you that maybe a city, the city buys up $60 million, that's your money, and then doesn't have a budget for the next decade. And what do you think about that? It's probably clear what I think about that, but what I'm trying to say here is, like, you should have a thought about that. Um, so, like, off and on for the past 10... Oh, sorry. I was like, I, I was like what's going on? <laughs> I've probably, like, three different times, four different times over the past, like, 10 years kind of had, like, the first several conversations towards starting... Um, a cooperative housing corporation with a group of people and we've looked at buildings and kind of like thrown the idea around. But um, I guess my question is like, what kind of timeline, could you give an example of like the chain of, I guess like the order of operations where do you, how do you form a cooperative housing corporation? Do you become that entity first and then approach banks and then find a property or do you, talk to a bank and then become a cooperative housing corporation? Because we've always kind of had this problem where we didn't know how to address just like cold call a bank or like cold call the real estate agent and be taken seriously because we weren't yet an entity, but then we didn't know how to become the cooperative housing corporation, things like that. Like, do you think you could... I'll just answer very briefly for the real estate investment co-op. And again, we're not doing housing. It feels important to keep saying, to establish some clarity around us. But um, we are just doing it all at the same time. So we're figuring out our governing body and we're figuring out um, membership agreements and a membership buy-in and what it means to be a member. And can members only be individuals or can they be institutions? We decided they can only be individuals. And we have a project vetting group that's trying to think about what kind of projects and an outreach to institutional investors group that's thinking about how we're going to get investments. And uh, the uh, lead facilitators like me are trying to think about how we can fund the admin work that's going into this. Um, and I don't know that this is the right or the best way, but it's the way that your goals, objectives, and capacity in deciding how you want to do it and have a lot of discussions about what those things mean for you. And that will help you figure out what the best way for you is. But I think Esther has something else to say. No, actually, I was going to say that um, I would I would uh, do it on two fronts. One, if you want to do something really f like a formal corporation or, or possibly like a RIC, I would go join their process because they're in such a learning phase. Equal assets. So if someone has a good credit score and someone has a down payment and someone's got a W-2 income, you know what I mean? Like, so you have to come up with how do we apportion the value of investment and then even more importantly, like once you figure out how you get enough money and how you're going to qualify, you have to figure out how the heck you're going to get out of it and still be friends or professional colleagues or however you define your relationship. So it's important to work closely with a lawyer to actually define legally what your relationships are going in and what your relationships are for getting out. But again, I see a lot of people coming together to buy, purchase three, four family buildings, something at a much smaller scale. Um, I think where it gets tricky is where one person's the handy person and one person's got a W-2 income. And, you know, but it's not impossible. And again, I feel like we are fantastic problem solvers. The only thing I would caution you is we also have fantastic imaginations. And you want to make sure that your facts and your imaginations meet. <laughs> yep. and I think that, um, you know, I got a lot of help from VLA, who's here actually, when we were setting up our nonprofit initially. And... Um, it was just, it's amazing with the resources that are out there. And I think that the information is there and there's people who really do want to help because they care about artists being in the city. And I think that, um, you know, incorporating and starting a nonprofit and all this stuff, it's not, it's not as big of a mountain as it seems. I think if you just go through this process and a lot of times I think you would want to do, you could do this before you have a space because it's like, it depends what your mission is, but creating content and archiving the content and showing what your potential is and your capacity, it can happen digitally and ethereally and with the language being formed before you can, you know, you have to get a space. And I think you just have to move forward. And there's definitely resources out there to help you. But do you this. have to save and get a good credit score. Yeah. That's be clear. Sure.
Actually, I think we have to wrap. Uh, we'll see the studio is outside up. to the left, 50 so, feet. Um, anyway, the, uh, thanks so much for everybody on the, uh, the ownership panel. We have one more thing coming up, the keynote. Um, so that's with uh, Tom Mangotti and myself. It'll be a QA. and a um, And that's going to happen in 15 minutes. So uh, feel free to walk around and, um, you know, rest up for the uh, final portion of the conference.